In the waters off North Carolina, a band of wreck divers are on a mission to reveal a lost chapter in World War II history. For six months in 1942, German U-boats ruled American waters, preying on Allied ships up and down the East Coast, even penetrating deep into the Gulf of Mexico. Hundreds of ships were torched. 5,000 lives were lost. It was incredible devastation, just miles from American homes. The killing zone peaked off the North Carolina coast. Now, it's an underwater graveyard where danger still lurks in the shadows. This is Torpedo Alley. August 2006, Moorhead City, North Carolina. For most people, summer along the Carolina coast means a week-long vacation of lazy days spent lying on the beach. For others, summer in North Carolina is a time for adventures below the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. To explore a world that not many are able to see. These guys aren't your average weekend warriors diving to see tropical fish. Air tastes really good right now. I think I've got the right mix too. They are wreck divers. Uh, when I get ready, just hand me uh, that camera. Led by expert diver Dan Kroll, they are about to come face to face with a forgotten piece of World War II history. A time in 1942 when German U-boats attacked American shores, sinking hundreds of Allied ships up and down the East Coast. No, no, I want it tighter. This one was coming down. Like... Dozens of these ships now lie off the North Carolina coast in an underwater graveyard called Torpedo Alley. For three days, Dan and his team will investigate five shipwrecks and two U-boats on the bottom of Torpedo Alley. Tankers with names like the Dixie Arrow, the Atlas, British Splendor, and the Lansing, whose torpedo holes and twisted metal are the evidence of an event that most people never knew. It's like we're, in, we're working in this huge underwater museum that only a handful of people have ever been to. Yeah, and that's... so the idea here is to share this uh, t with not only, you know, just the uh, other people, but to take this and say, hey, look, this, this really happened here. These shipwrecks are ghostly reminders of just how close the Nazi threat came to America's doorstep. But these towering hulks cannot withstand the ravages of time. 65 years at the bottom of the Atlantic are taking their toll. Armed with underwater cameras, Dan Kroll and his crew hope to preserve this little known turning point in World War II for future generations. In time, it's the, the effects of the ocean, the salt water, right. that these things are going to be nothing but a rust stain on the right, uh, ocean right. floor. So uh, now's the time to document a lot of this history, right. Right. this underwater history. Um, you know, for future generations to share. The wrecks in Torpedo Alley recall a time when terror came right to our shores. January 1942. The United States has been fighting World War II for only one month, but already finds itself up against the wall. Nazi U-boats have invaded American waters, prowling the eastern seaboard and sinking dozens of ships. The attacks are the master plan of German Admiral Karl Dönitz, codename Operation Drumbeat. The idea was simple. Bring the war directly to the United States and target merchant shipping. The U.S. has been transporting food, weapons, oil, and gasoline in waves across the Atlantic. 
If the Germans are going to win the war, these supply lines have to be stopped. The U-boat was the perfect weapon for the task, a 220-foot by 20-foot tube of iron and steel that becomes invisible beneath the waves and capable of submerging over 700 feet. U-boat technology had been around since the turn of the century, but at the time was considered nothing more than a novelty. It wasn't until the outbreak of World War I when the German submarine U-9 sank three British cruisers that the world sat up and paid attention. In just one hour, nearly 1,400 British sailors were killed and a deadly weapon of war was born. The end of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles put a halt to German war production. But with the rise of the Nazi party, Adolf Hitler ordered the secret rebuilding of Germany's military and the U-boat fleet. By the beginning of World War II, German engineers had developed U-boats so advanced that they could cross the Atlantic and back without refueling. For the first time, the long arm of the German war machine could reach the United States. Instead of zooming in, better off just bringing the camera closer whenever available, rather because uh, it's just going to keep the shot, the shot steadier. All divers share a common love of exploration, but there's no doubt that wreck divers are a band apart. Their dives send them down as far as 250 feet below the surface. Depths that require years of training and detailed technical skills. The dangers can range from hungry sharks to running out of air to the giddy sensations of nitrogen narcosis. If a diver makes a mistake at 250 feet, the result will likely be deadly. I'm going to be up and above Dan, just looking down, getting yeah. that nice wide right, shot. Yeah. Before they descend, the divers check and recheck themselves with an assortment of gauges, valves, and dials designed to keep them alive under the most extreme circumstances. Amid the masks, fins, gloves, and scuba tanks, each diver begins their ritual of getting ready to head down to the Dixie Arrow. At 70 to 90 feet deep, most wreck divers consider the Dixie Arrow shallow water. But even at those depths, meticulous preparation is crucial. You know, most of the planning is done ahead of time, uh, as much as possible. Of course, it takes several years of, of, of training yourself to do that. Being mentally prepared for a dive is just as important, if not more, than you know, having your equipment ready. For anyone who straps on an air tank and fins, understanding the science behind submerging is a crucial component in exploring the deep. One of the most well-known problems that divers face underwater is decompression sickness, or what has become known as the bends. The bends is an explosion inside the human body. The longer and deeper a diver is in the water, the more pressure builds up on the gases in the body. The bends occur when a diver ascends from deep water too quickly. This sudden release of pressure causes bubbles to form in the bloodstream. These bubbles can cause crippling pain in your joints and in severe cases can even lead to death. The only way to fight the bends is for a diver to slowly come up from the deep, gradually releasing the gases from the body. An idea similar to opening a bottle of soda only by slowly turning the cap can you prevent the pressurized liquid from bubbling out. Of all the ships the Germans were determined to sink, none were more critical than the oil tankers carrying precious wartime gasoline. If oil and gasoline production could be destroyed at the source, it could mean an early victory for the Germans and an end to World War II. One tanker that fell prey to the U-boats was the Dixie Arrow. On the afternoon of March 26, 1942, she was sailing along the Carolina coast, heading straight into the heart of Torpedo Alley. 
The Dixiero lies off Cape Hatteras, almost 90 feet beneath the sea. Her remains swarm by schools of fish and sharks that stand on guard. As Dan Kroll and the rest of the dive team begin their descent down the anchor line, the Dixie Arrow comes into focus. As a tanker carrying 96,000 barrels of crude oil, the crew of the Dixie Arrow knew they had a bullseye on their back. What they didn't know was that on March 26, 1942, a German U-boat was about to take aim. There are many factors that come into play when a U-boat goes in for a kill. Timing, skill, and a lot of luck are key roles in the battle at sea between predator and prey. The first order of business is to find a target, and World War II's coal-fired ships made that easy. U-boat crews would scan the waters and could see black smoke billowing on the horizon. Next, it's time to ready the torpedoes, sometimes called the eel by U-boat crews. At 23 feet long, a torpedo was a 3,500-pound sleek piece of underwater dynamics, rigged with a 620-pound warhead that could achieve speeds of up to 50 miles per hour. The torpedoes used were Type G7, of which there were two kinds, the Type A and the Type E. The Type A was faster and had a greater range, but the compressed air used to power the torpedo meant that telltale bubble trails were left in its wake. An enemy could easily follow the trail back to where the torpedo came from. The electric motor of the Type E eliminated this problem, but their primary drawback was maintenance. Each torpedo required constant upkeep. The complicated inner parts meant that every three days, checks on the battery, guidance system, and control mechanisms were needed. This vigilant maintenance was absolutely essential because preparing for a torpedo attack required lightning reflexes from the crew. The key to a successful attack was not about firing a torpedo to where a target is, but calculating where it was going to be by the time the torpedo got there. On the afternoon of March 26, 1942, the crew of the U-71 makes the perfect calculations. She sends three torpedoes directly into the side of the Dixie Arrow. Flames quickly engulf the tanker, turning the ship into a blazing inferno. Many were trapped in compartments with no choice but to be burned alive or jump into the flaming sea. But one man made a difference. Although severely injured, seaman Oscar G. Chapel is able to get to the wheelhouse and take control of the ship. He turns the tanker into the wind, driving the waterborne flames away from the trapped men on the bow and allowing them to jump clear of the burning oil. But Chapel's actions also bring the fire directly back on the wheelhouse, which was quickly engulfed in flames. Oscar Chapel's actions saved the lives of his shipmates but rescuing the Dixie Arrow was impossible. Today, the Dixie Arrow's steel skeleton lies on its side, about a 500-foot wreck from bow to stern. The bottom is strewn with jagged and bent pieces of metal jutting outwards, some possibly twisted by the massive explosions that took her down. If there is any evidence of the fire that engulfed the Dixie Arrow, 65 years at the bottom of the ocean has made it hard to find. I go down the anchor line, and you know, yes, there is there is wreckage, but uh, you know, unless you really look hard, you're not going to know what that wreck is. It's just, this thing is just all over the place. Getting a little bit more into view, I can see there's a rudder, there's there's a part of a propeller, and I'm going, wow, this thing is really just wiped out. Right. Uh, swimming a little bit farther forward. There's an engine, a little bit farther forward, the boilers. But reality is, is there's no way that you could look at this wreck and say, oh, this is where a torpedo hit, this is where this hit, this is where that hit. As the divers make their way around the wreck, a unique danger lurks in the shadows. 
dozens of sharks that guard this graveyard begin to gather. And unfortunately, a diver never knows the last time they ate. You know, what occurred to me is why I'm down there. Is you can't get overcome by fear of the shark because you still have to do your decompression or, you know, safety stops if you're doing a no-deco dive. So yeah. if you're scared of a shark, that's kind of a secondary concern. We've got Atlantic sand tigers, you know, our right. friends with the two dorsal fins, and they're just kind of like cows in a field, but underwater. They just kind of like mosey away from me. Sometimes you gotta push them away from you. But they are pretty good sized sharks. They are number four as far as attacks on humans. Right. So it, it's still a little disconcerting to be down there by yourself and having, you know, uh, sharkies are that big, but more importantly, several of these sharks in that size yeah. range. I found myself on the, uh, on the other end of the wreck several times by myself, surrounded by not just 10 or 20, but like 30 or 40 uh, of these sand tigers. <laughs> sand tigers, like you said, is not the issue. It's the it's the bull sharks that like to hide, you know, in their shadow, kind of like <laughs> kind of like doing one of these things. By May of 1942, U-boats had begun to make their way around the Florida Panhandle, deep into the Gulf of Mexico, targeting ships as they left port cities like Galveston, Texas, and New Orleans, penetrating deep into America's own backyard. But the population wasn't getting the message. Blackouts were not enforced along coastal U.S. cities, which allowed the U-boats easy, lighted navigation. Some towns in Florida even refused to turn out the lights in fear it would destroy their tourist trade. German U-boat commanders were astonished at the lack of defenses, noting with utter disbelief that the lights were on as in peacetime and that cars were easily seen driving along coastal roads. As U-boat attacks up and down the East Coast grew daily in intensity, Germany's goal of choking off American oil supplies was quickly becoming a reality. But that doesn't mean every wreck in Torpedo Alley is a tanker. As the U-boat terror along the East Coast entered its third month in early 1942, the Allies suffered a staggering toll. Dozens of ships sunk without a single U-boat kill. Despite the carnage, Navy brass responded sluggishly to the U-boat threat. After the destruction at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Ernest J. King focused solely on the war in the Pacific waiting months to organize and employ anti-U-boat tactics. However, as March turned to April and May, the Navy finally began implementing effective measures to protect shipping. Convoys and escorts provided safety in numbers, while air patrols were increased. Although the U-boats were still keeping one step ahead of the Allies, they did have a potentially fatal weakness. A crew living in a steel tube for up to two or three months at a time meant constant problems. Internal heat was generated from the engines, carbon dioxide builds up, lack of fresh air, and all around claustrophobia were daily issues. The reality was that you couldn't stay underwater forever. In July of 1942, all of these factors caused the captain of U-701 to come to the surface and ventilate his boat. But at the worst time possible, in daylight hours. As the U-701 prepared to return to its underwater refuge, it was spotted by a Coast Guard aircraft. Now, the tables would be turned on the German U-boat. The most devastating weapon the Allies had in combating U-boats were depth charges. Barrel-sized explosives that could rip apart a submarine hull in mere seconds. The aircraft dropped three depth charges as the U-701 was trying to make its emergency dive. The first depth charge fell short 
but the second and third hit the U-boat near the conning tower just as it slipped beneath the waves. However, the depth charge was close enough to crack the pressure hull, and water began to fill the U-boat. It was a fatal hit, and the captain ordered abandoned ship. The U-701 made its way back up to the surface, but not in time. 17 crew members, including the captain, barely escaped through the hatch before the U-701 finally sank beneath the waves. The men were now set adrift, floating at sea for more than two days until they were finally picked up by the Americans. Only seven of the 17 had survived. Another U-boat, the U-352, would meet a similar end. When the submarine spotted a target on patrol, she quickly fired two torpedoes, but both failed to hit their intended victim. Unfortunately for the U-352, that ship wasn't an oil tanker, but instead turned out to be the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Icarus. The U-352 dived as the Icarus quickly turned and fired five depth charges. The U-boat made it underwater, but was severely damaged internally. The conning tower suffered damage, and the deck gun was completely blown off. Two more depth charges forced the U-352 to the surface, and the commander ordered the scuttling and abandonment of the submarine. In the end, 33 German survivors were taken to Charleston, South Carolina, as prisoners of war. The wreckage of the U-352 and U-701 provide an opportunity for the divers to see for themselves the enemy that terrorized shipping in 1942. Although both submarines have been underwater for 65 years, up against the ravages of the sea and time, the most distinctive feature of these U-boats still remains intact. The conning towers of both the U-352 and U-701 rise above the ocean floor. The 88-millimeter deck gun of the U-701 also stands at attention, almost ready to fire off another round. In fact, a U-boat's deck gun was often used to take down an enemy boat, rather than use one of the few precious torpedoes. The sand both helps and hinders the preservation of the wrecks. It protects from the elements and is why large portions of the U-boat structure are still intact. Only the most exposed areas have been blasted away by the combination of sand and current continually pounding the surface. Today, the steel carcasses of the U-boats are imposing sights. But as each year passes, less and less of these ships remain. Both submarines are deeper than the Dixie Arrow and require different skills to explore them. A German submarine in diveable American waters is not a common sight. At 115 feet, the U-352 provides a challenge that Dan Kroll can't pass up. For many divers, the real thrills of exploration are found inside a wreck. But this perspective is restricted to very experienced divers. Even for them, sharp rusty edges and labyrinth passages make a wreck penetration extremely dangerous. Dan Kroll squeezes through a torpedo hatch on the U-352 to explore the interior of the sub and sees for himself the cramped conditions a U-boat crew had to endure. As I get, went into the forward section, I tried to get the camera up there. And, but as I worked aft, there's a, a, a toilet right, right, right. here. And, but the doorways are just so narrow. I mean, my rebreather is only approximately like 16 or so inches wide. And I was just barely fitting through that door. You kind of had to squint, scrunch through. As you go forward into this next uh, section, um, it was mainly probably cruise quarter area. It's just empty. There's really, there's nothing there. And then as you move further aft, you go into the control room area. Um, that's where everything took place. This is like the, the war room. This is where every, all the operation of submarine occurred. Uh, you had the ter periscope and the conning tower. You could actually look up into the conning tower. 
a lot of the partitions and a lot of the stuff is long since rotted away. But I came across like the oven. There's you know this oven still attached there, and it's like an oven that could almost be in you know grandma's kitchen. And you're like you know here's all this this war armament and all this stuff going on. But the reality is you, you, you know you still have to have some sort of you know you're human beings. There's some sort of little comfort level that needs to occur. For two or three months at a stretch, these iron tubes were homes, a place where about 50 men had to live and work together in a space not much larger than a two-bedroom apartment. Life was cramped and stressful beneath the waves. Three men would have to share one bunk in shifts. Diesel smells from the engine room would permeate the entire ship, saturating clothes and skin. Body odors reeked from every corner of the submarine and saltwater showers couldn't hide them. These hardships were a badge of honor for U-boat crews. In 1942, to join the all-volunteer U-boat corps was to be one of Germany's military elite. Dan Kroll and a team of wreck divers have come face to face with a World War II campaign of shock and awe. In 1942, German submarines were on a six month killing spree that peaked off the North Carolina coast in a zone that came to be known as Torpedo Alley. Now, the divers have gone over 100 feet below to see the Prove, the U-352 and the U-701. Both of these U-boats were part of a master plan to destroy Allied merchant shipping and oil tankers in American waters. But it turns out that Nazi war plans weren't only about attacking the Americans at sea. In June of 1942, two teams of German spies came across the Atlantic in U-boats with a mission to sabotage the American war industry at home. It was an audacious plan, using expatriate German Americans to infiltrate the U.S. and terrorize the population by blowing up railways, production plants, and even poisoning New York City's drinking water. The plan almost worked. A spy team actually made it into New York City. However, it all came crashing down when one saboteur got cold feet and turned himself in to the FBI. Although the capture of these enemy spies made the front pages, wartime censors attempted to keep the U-boat carnage out of the public eye, fearing panic if the population knew how close the enemy was coming to their shores. There was good reason to be fearful. The men who manned the U-boats were the elite of the German military. The captains were hand-picked to lead in impossible situations and against even more impossible odds. Among them was Eric Topp, a 27-year-old captain whose exploits made him the third most successful German U-boat commander of World War II. Three of his victims now rest at the bottom of Torpedo Alley, the British Splendor, the Atlas, and the Lansing. All of these tankers sunk within 72 hours of each other during one of Topp's triumphant campaigns as captain of U-552. Now, Dan Kroll and his team head out for another day of diving and come face to face with these three victims of U-552. On the morning of April 7, 1942, the British Splendor was the first victim to enter the periscope of Captain Top. As the tanker made its way up past Cape Hatteras, the U-552 lay in wait and then sent a speeding torpedo right into the hull, igniting 10,000 gallons of gasoline. But the British Splendor was only the first fireball to light the sky that day. The Lansing and her 8,800 tons of fuel oil were next in line as Captain Top sent another torpedo and another ship to her death. Two days after the destruction of the British Splendor and the Lansing, the tanker Atlas became the final victim of U-552. Like most wrecks, 
you you go down there this was sitting upright um, when it hit bottom and over a period of time of course it's deteriorated and it's typically if you go from stern to bow and start moving along here's the engine then you have the boilers and then as you move forward from that you have an area that's just completely flattened out in, com right. in contrast to the right. rest of the wreck the rest of the wreck's in pretty pretty sad shape but this area where it's just totally demolished is, right. is probably the area where the torpedo hit and as you move a little bit farther forward it's god it's really eerie because as it came into view you had these like spires sticking up where these corners and pieces were were, were kind of reminded you of the the uh, um, after the bombing of Britain where mm -hmm. maybe just chimneys oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ch chimneys or just corners right. of buildings would be sticking sure. up the next ship the divers investigate is the final victim of U-552, the Lansing. Resting down below at 160 feet, the intact wreck of the Lansing is a stark contrast to that of the damaged Atlas. Fortunately for the divers, that makes the Lansing fairly straightforward to navigate despite its size and depth. Of all the sights on the ship, the huge four-bladed propeller is the most spectacular and gives a perspective as to how large the ship was. The Lansing lies at 160 feet, which means for a half hour dive, the excess buildup of nitrogen in the body requires almost an hour of decompression, or as divers put it, off-gassing. Decompression is imperative, but even the most experienced diver can be tempted to recklessly disregard years of training. Shark attacks or running out of air can quickly create panic and cause a diver to shoot up to the surface, a surefire way to bring on the bends. But even a proper decompression doesn't rule out the risks. Tons of sharks, great visibility. After the group returns from their time on the Lansing, one diver begins to complain of joint pain, a classic symptom of decompression sickness. He's working on it right now. The fear is that nitrogen bubbles may have formed between the joints and muscles. To help, oxygen is administered to counterbalance the excess nitrogen. However, the team decides not to take any chances, and the Coast Guard is called as a precautionary measure. If there is any possibility of a full-blown attack of the bends coming on, the dive boat won't have the proper tools to take care of this. The Coast Guard arrives a short time later and examines the diver, who is still breathing with the help of oxygen. After a full evaluation, he's sent back to shore for a more complete examination. When it comes to the bends, speed is of the utmost urgency, and the need to get immediate treatment is critical. Severe cases of the bends may need to be treated by sitting in a decompression chamber, a device that can change atmospheric pressure, allowing the body to gradually readjust. For this diver, his symptoms were a false alarm, but with the bends, there is no margin for error. Extreme caution is the only policy. Their final dive becomes the most challenging and takes them down further than they've been before. 240 feet beneath the waves to the E.M. Clark. Typical scuba diving rarely goes past 100 feet, but the Clark is at a depth for only the most advanced technical divers. The E.M. Clark was a tanker carrying heating oil from Baton Rouge to New York when she crossed paths with U-124 on March 18, 1942. It was a busy night for the U-boat, having torpedoed two other ships only hours earlier. Now it was time for the Clark to meet her fate. In the early morning hours, the explosion of a torpedo awoke the captain. As he quickly raced to the bridge, a second torpedo slammed into the side of the boat. There was still confusion among the crew as drops of liquid started falling around the ship. Some believed that a rain had begun to fall. Instead, it was tiny black droplets of oil. The crew realized there was no stopping the ultimate destruction of the ship. 
Once it was clear the fate of the E.M. Clark was sealed, the captain quickly ordered an abandoned ship and the crew immediately made their way to lifeboats. Within minutes, the Clark began to come apart in the middle and the surviving crew lowered their lifeboats into the sea. As they drifted away from the flaming ship, the stern of the Clark suddenly lifted high into the sky. With one last gasp, the Clark took a straight plunge beneath the water and down into the abyss. As Dan Kroll and the divers make their way down the anchor line, immediately they catch a view of the Clark's massive size. About a hundred feet off the wreck, it is possible to view the entire stern section of the hull, the last thing the crew saw before she plummeted to the ocean floor. The Clark is the deepest wreck the dive team is facing. And at 240 feet below, its condition is among the best preserved in Torpedo Alley. All the other wrecks, there's no way anyone could figure out what sank it. You know, couldn't go there and today and say, hey, you know, well, there's a torpedo hole, or there's a shell hole, or there's this, yeah. or there's that. They're just basically have, have uh, uh, fallen apart without, you know, any evidence of, of why. So as we swam along filming, right. uh, you got to where the bridge used to be, right. and you could see right through oh, okay. the bottom of, a, of the wreck. So that's obviously, you know, a torpedo right. hole. A it's times, obvious it that that's happened. where the torpedo hit the, uh, the, the ship, put a hole in it, and that's where it sank. Decompression is the final stage to any dive. And as Dan Kroll finishes his time on the Clark, he plans to attempt a technique called drift decompression, or drift deco by divers. Typically, after divers finish their bottom time, they make their decompression stops along the anchor line that connects the wreck to the dive boat. But drift decompression is another option, and it works exactly the way it sounds. A diver makes the usual decompression stops needed to come to the surface, but instead of being tethered to the anchor line, divers let the currents carry them out to sea. A drift deco is a crucial skill for any advanced diver to know. In some cases, a diver may get lost, not have time to find the anchor line, and needs to start decompression before running out of air. Or it's possible the anchor line you came down 20 minutes ago is gone when you return. I may very well have come back to the uh, anchor line, and, and if you look at the de deterioration of the wreck, even though the wreck is all in one big piece, there's a lot of areas where the hull plates are missing. There's dark areas that are just nothing but holes, and it very well could have pulled out one of those hull plates, and you know, so you come back and your, your exit point has now disappeared completely, so now you have to be able to do what you need to, to get yourself to the surf line safely. You get on some of these wrecks, the current's so strong it could take you off the wreck. Yeah. And uh, you know, next thing you know, you're out drifting in the, mm. out in the blue. The key to a successful drift decompression is the use of a lift bag. In essence, a brightly colored balloon that rises to the surface and is used as a marker for the dive boat to locate the diver. The twisted metal and steel of Torpedo Alley are stark reminders of a time when America's back was against the wall. Uncovering this history is what Dan Kroll and the dive team lived to explore beneath the waves. The thrill of seeing the proof that during World War II, the U-boat threat off American shores was no myth. The toll of the U-boat attacks along the eastern United States was staggering. In only six months, some 397 ships were sent to the bottom of the ocean, killing nearly 5,000 people, a majority of which were civilians and merchant marines. But by the beginning of 1943, the tide had turned against the U-boats. The Allies had built new warships. Convoys and air patrols became the rule rather than the exception. The 
the U-boats would never again achieve the kind of success that was seen during the first six months of 1942 in Torpedo Alley, North Carolina.